It's Friday, November the 18th, 2022. The last word in podcasting news. This is the Pod News Weekly Review with James Cridlin and Sam Sethi. I'm James Cridlin, the editor of Pod News. And I'm Sam Sethi, the host of Sam Talks Technology, which is coming soon, I promise. This is Jay LaBeouf, head of business and corporate development at Descript. In this episode, we're going to talk about Descript's OpenAI fund investment, and also the new version of Descript that includes tons of video editing capabilities. In the chapters today, video podcasting on Spotify and YouTube, Apple's hidden topic tags, and the IAB goes for annual recertification. This podcast is sponsored and hosted by Buzzsprout. Last week, 3,524 lovely people started a podcast with Buzzsprout. Podcast hosting made easy with powerful tools and remarkable customer support. From your daily newsletter, the Pod News Weekly Review. So to kick off, is video podcasting about to take over? Yes, is it indeed? Spotify has released a video podcast everywhere in 180 global markets. Until now, they've only been in 12 markets. The proprietary service launched in April. Okay, James, come on. Is this a good idea from Spotify? And are there any examples we can all see? I mean, there is a, a, an example of a guy called Joe Rogan. Not quite sure whether you've heard of him. But anyway, he's apparently got a big podcast. And that is a Course. He's back at number one. Yes, for the moment. Uh, and that is, of course, available in video on Spotify. You can go and uh, watch that. They're very keen to highlight the fact that you can uh, watch the video if you want to, or you can just keep it playing on background. Why would they be keen to highlight that? Because that's what YouTube only offers you if you pay money. Uh, so uh, Spotify trying to be, I think, a little bit clever here and all of a sudden launching in 180 global markets. Up until right now, they've only been in 12 markets. They only launched in April. They can't be bothered really to update their blog posts because the blog posts were made in July and they've literally just added a line saying, yeah, it's now available everywhere uh, on there. So, um, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure how committed they are to it, but interesting to see launched in 180 different global markets. I mean, I think it's interesting that this is only working for shows that host with Anchor and only working if you play back in Spotify. And of course, there is this thing called open, you know, video podcasts. Lots of them are available. And in fact, I went to do some analysis on the podcast index. There are now 53,000 video podcast shows on RSS. That number's up 38% year on year. And they'll play back on pretty well anything, you know, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, whatever you want. So um, uh, clearly Spotify is in competition with that. Uh, and also there's another competitor, isn't there, Sam? Uh, yes, there is, James, of course. And in its clearest sign yet, uh, YouTube's growing um, podcast ambitions. We keep waiting for them to do something properly, but their video website has published a full guide on how to uh, podcast on the platform. And it's also got a link to its podcast best practices guide, uh, which goes into channel and content strategy. So I don't know what all that means. Does this mean that Anchor or Spotify knows something that we don't, i.e. that you YouTube's about to do something soon, so they thought they'd get in early. Or is it just a case of, uh, you know, this has been in the background since July, let's just push it out a little further and see what happens? Well, I find it suspicious that uh, Spotify has all of a sudden released their video podcasts everywhere on the week that YouTube publish a full guide on how to podcast on YouTube. Um, anybody would think that those must be linked in some way, shape or form. YouTube's um, documents are really interesting. There's a lot that I've seen before in the leaked PDF that I was given in March of this year. It goes into a lot of best practices on whether or not you should have different channels for your podcast, how you should work out the uh, channels, all of that kind of stuff. But the most interesting thing, I think, from my point of view is around that playlists thing that you said. They use the word critical. They are critical to to the proper displaying of your podcast. One of the frustrations with Zapier, if you upload your podcast in video through a Zapier zap, is that uh, Zapier has no concept of playlists. And so I now need to work out how I can um, fix that and make sure that uh, the automated version of the Pod News Daily that goes up on there is actually automatically added to the Pod News Daily playlist. But you can also find this show on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at sign Pod News. 
Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Talking of headliner, uh, they've just announced that they're letting you upload your entire podcast to YouTube. So from your first episode to now, it's available for pro or enterprise users. Um, I didn't realise that you couldn't upload your entire podcast before. I always thought you could because maybe I've been doing that. Maybe I've been on their beta. I don't know. I need to go back and look. But uh, Yeah, the difference there is that they have um, allowed you to go back from your first ever episode and bulk upload all of those so that your entire show is available on YouTube. What they've offered in the past is they've offered the chance for all new shows to be added onto YouTube automatically. Uh, So that's the big uh, difference there, which is quite cool. So you can end up with the full archive of your show um, using uh, Headliner, and I was using Headliner only this afternoon, and it's a very cool and smart uh, tool as well. Now, you mentioned Descript there as well, and of course, Descript has just launched their new version called Descript Storyboard. Well, actually, it's not called Descript Storyboard, it's just called Descript it was internally called Storyboard. And they've also raised an amazing round of 50 million US dollars from the Open AI Startup Fund. And I thought, now that we both use Descript, James, and uh, that they've come up with this new version, I thought I'd reach out to Jay LeBeur from Descript and find out more about what's in this new version of Descript and uh, what their plans are with all this new money from Open AI. Descript is an all-in-one video and audio editing service. Think of it as a a tool that's like a Google Doc. And in the same way that a Google Doc allows anybody to collaborate and just edit text, well, we allow you to edit audio and video as easily as editing text. And the goal of Descript has always been to eliminate all that tedious work that stands between, hey, here's the thing I want to do, and just getting it done and getting it out there. And Descript was very much known for being a podcasting tool and a transcription tool and had that cool trick of allowing you to just delete a sentence you didn't want to say with one click, remove all of your filler words from your podcast interviews, shorten word gaps. But we've been layering in tons of video editing capabilities over the past year. Internally, we called it Storyboard, but really to the outside world, now it is just the new Descript. So... I've been a fan of Descript for many years now. It was a game changer when I first found it. I actually found it from listening to an Andreessen Horowitz podcast. And I thought, that sounds amazing. And then literally when I put my first MP3 up and it did the auto transcription and speaker voice detection, and then I was editing, it was a genuine game changer. So when you came out with the beta for Storyboard, it is different. For anyone who's used Descript, it does feel a little different. I mean, even Andrew in the video launch has said, you know, you might find a few buttons missing and they've moved around a bit and keyboard shortcuts have changed names and there's nothing we can do about it. So what is Storyboard fundamentally? What's new about Descript? So yeah, as you mentioned, Andrew Mason, our CEO, he also uses this other expression that you're going to have to rewire your brain. Mm -hmm. And I've always said that when people come in from an audio perspective, because the first thing they do is they reach for the timeline at the bottom. They look for their favorite waveforms and they try to expand the heck out of them. And they use that as their primary mode of operation. So with Storyboard, with our redesign, we wanted to really bring the focus to text-based editing and using the script as your guide. And so it overwhelmingly takes up the screen now. And You can always expand out the timeline. You have access to layers and fades and keyframe automation and audio effects and all the good stuff. But we want people thinking about the script and the content first. So that was one of the main things that we've done in the redesign. Another piece is something that I think audio creators would really like is we created like a different mode. So we've always had edit mode, but now we have write mode. So with write mode, you can just get in there and start typing. And outlining your scripted intros and pasting in materials for how you want a a certain section to go and put in your questions and then even assign those to an overdub voice. So we actually have teams that are using it for pre-production where they'll actually have their hosts create an overdub voice. For those of you that might not know, overdub is our voice cloning technology. So there's just a ton of AI packed into Descript one of which is our voice cloning technology called Overdub and allows anybody to create their own Overdub voice or their voice clone with as little as 10 minutes of themselves speaking. 
So you speak into the system for 10 minutes, you get your own voice clone, or you can have your host do their voice clone, and then your team has access to it. So now you can imagine scripting out an entire show in advance with the host's dialogue, with the host's Q&A, see how that sounds, start pulling in B-roll, creating from that. So again, you're creating from the script up, not from a collection of audio files, but from the script up. Yeah, and it really is a change in terminology that as a Descript user, you've gone from, you know, the way that we talked about it in the past with transcripts. Now it's about layers and scenes and scripts. So talk to me a little bit about how the video editing works. It's something called scenes, which is a change in the way that people, I suppose, approach video editing from traditional applications that are out there. Yeah, exactly. So scenes are a visual paradigm that allows you to go into the script track and just break into different visual scenes. So those of you that have seen a screenplay, it's the same analogy. You have that part where you're describing, okay, it's a new scene. Now it's interior coffee shop, clanking of glasses in the background, things like that. By just dropping the slash key in front of a sentence or even in the middle of a sentence, middle of a paragraph, you're telling Descript that a different scene is occurring. And that basically allows you to operate on that scene as if it's a different visual identity. So right now, Sam, we're looking at each other. This is a two camera shoot in Squadcast. We could bring over these two cameras into Descript and we could actually go through either using AI or manually and decide when we want the camera changes to occur. We can also drop in a whole bunch of templates, for example. So I could create a scene which is like us debating something and it's, you know, two up where we can see both of us at the same time. But then as I'm doing my long monologue now, you would probably drag in the template that makes me like front and center and then you're slightly minimized, but your show logo is up there too. So all, all this is to describe, like, think of scenes as a way of telling the scripts that something is happening and that you want the properties of that to be preserved. And then the other metaphor we often use is think of scenes as slides. You know, mm -hmm. we've always said you can use Descript like it's a Google Doc. But now with scenes, you can actually think of those as like, great, they're like Google Slides. Yeah, I do. And it is very easy to do. And I think in the same way that Descript original, classic, whatever we want to call it, was democratizing audio editing, I think Storyboard is going to democratize video editing. And I find it is actually quite an easy, simple, intuitive way to do it. But I have to ask, does Andrew just like his keyboard? Does he not have a mouse? Because shortcut keyboards are everywhere in Descript because I'm not a, a keyboard person. So is Andrew just a keyboard person? We're a company that values productivity tools. You know, one right. of Andrew's favorite things is productivity tools. It's, it's clear a lot of these tools are just rich with keyboard shortcuts. And if you take the time and investment to learn the keyboard shortcuts, you're a wizard. You know, I started my career on the Pro Tools team. You'd probably remember this, Sam. Like, I, I mean, there were literally companies that manufacture Pro Tools keyboards, not only stickers that you yep. can put on your keyboards, but like a dedicated Pro Tools keyboard that you can buy, Avid Media Composer keyboards, Final Cut keyboards. So real professionals at the top of their craft really get into this and realize the time savings they have. We are always trying to find ways of doing it. And also we are not ashamed to be inspired by other companies. So things like Command K or Control K on Windows. It, in most apps, you can use that and something cool will happen. So, you know, we use Notion a lot. So I can hit Command K in Notion and I can just instantly jump to a new page or insert whatever I want. In Descript, that's like, the magic keyboard shortcut. You can type in captions, you can type in waveform, you know, anything you want, and that will just start happening. So that's kind of more of where we want people to go is, again, to not like follow their instincts and reach for the waveform and try to drag handles of a fade, but just kind of tell us what you want to have happen. And Descript should hopefully interpret that. Now, clearly with Storyboard, there is a heavy focus on video, lots of new features. But also lots of export features. You've TikTok in there. You've got GIFs. You've got Reels. You've got YouTube. I mean, clearly there has been a decision-making process within Descript that says, eh, 2023, that looks like a real video world and we need to get in there. Is that the thinking behind it? 
Yeah. So we have built in just a ton. I think it's 30 plus video editing features. And we were talking earlier and you mentioned Descript's looking really video heavy now. Well, one thing is we just had a ton of catch up to do. You know, we've always been able to edit video by editing text, but we wanted to make Descript the place where if you're an audio creator and you need video, great, it's there. And it's always been this weird historical accident that you had to choose, is this an audio first project or a video first project? And we really think we have a paradigm for doing both. And I think the workflow from going and starting with audio and then deciding, okay, now I need a new composition and create a social media template on it. And I need all sorts of different aspect ratios that should all be possible within one app. And then you should be able to export out to all of your favorite destinations. So, you know, we do have tons of exports to YouTube, to most of the major podcast hosts for business users to places like Wistia. We don't have a native TikTok integration or Reels yet, but rest assured, I'm, we're talking to those companies. What I meant by that is you can change the aspect ratios of yeah. the videos to export into those platforms. So let's take a look at the funding a little bit. So the OpenAI Startup Fund has put $50 million Series C round into you. Congratulations. What does that mean for you guys? I mean, first and foremost, obviously it gives you the timeline on the roadmap to go and do what you want to do. But what's the relationship now going to be with OpenAI? So Descript has always been a AI driven app and we believe in exposing the AI to people, you know, very much behind the scenes, not with a series of 400 knobs and sliders and command lines for them to type stuff in, but things like studio sound, our voice enhancement tech, which is basically one button and then a, a slider if you really need to control the intensity. And that philosophy is shared by OpenAI as well. I mean, they're really groundbreakers in everything from text summarization to text to image and so many areas that they're working on, I think, could be perfect integration possibilities for us. So we're super early days of figuring out what we're going to do with them. But, you know, squint, look off in the distance. Oh, my God, there's gonna be so much that we can do. Yeah. The one question everyone's going to ask is, are you going to build in Whisper into Descript? Yeah. So we have Descript working in, I think, 28, 29 languages right now. We have very close integrations with our transcription providers. So it's not something that we would ever consider doing overnight, but the completely political and accurate answer is anytime we would even consider a change like that is going to require a lot of work behind the scenes and a lot of analysis of how it impact our customers, ideally for the better. So, you know, can't speak to it yet, but we want to do what's best for our customers. Now, one of the good things about Descript is that you have integrated with partners. So you've got an integration with Squadcast, you've got an integration with numerous hosts. But it does feel that, you know, you talked about the element of pre-production scripting now that you can do within Storyboard, with Overdub, and in Write Mode. We talk about post-production, which is the editing part, and we talk about publishing as well, which you have as part of Descript. It does feel like you're trying to do the whole workflow. Will there ever be a point at which I will not use Squadcast or StreamYard or whatever, but I would use native Descript to record everything? Because you already have a video recording capability. It doesn't seem like a big stretch to go that one stage further. So you're right on the video recording capability. We have native multi-track video and screen recording. So I can record my desktop, it preserves my video, it keeps my audio and my computer audio as separate tracks. So you can have four or five tracks layered up, but those are just local to your, your individual desktop. The tech stack that companies like Squadcast and Restream have built up is incredibly impressive and serves a, a totally different need. It serves you know people like you and I who need to do high quality interviews and ensure nothing happens to the quality of that. So I really admire what they've built and that would add a ton of surface area to us. So really our mission right now is to make Descript the best video editor and audio editor out there. And then, you know, my role as a business development professional is to ensure that all of the content that's out there flows into Descript. So ensuring that we have this edit and Descript relationship with Squadcast where uncompressed multi-track audio files can flow into Descript for editing. They can do what they're doing and we can kind of work together to support them. 
It flows seamlessly into Descript, which provides editing capabilities that makes their platform more useful. And then from a publishing standpoint, we can do really cool stuff. Like since all of your assets are kind of always sitting in the cloud, we can render them up to 10 times, 20 times faster in the cloud than we could locally. So when it's time to say, hey, let's just publish this to Buzzsprout, I don't think the right thing to do is to add more surface area and decide, yeah, we should become a podcast host too. Rather, let's integrate with the top podcast hosts and then make sure that we render the audio in the cloud, the video in the cloud, send them the transcripts, captions. You know, The more surface area you take on as a product, the sloppier it's going to look. And we've all seen products that have just gotten too sprawly and too complicated to use. And, you know, Descript has this simplicity of like, you drag stuff in and text appears and you just hit the delete key and stuff happens that you want to actually have happen. Yeah, don't be a jack of all trades, be a master of one or two. That's it. Now, Jay, thank you so much for that. Look, congratulations once again on the new funding. Loving storyboard. But please tell everyone where they can go if they want to start playing with Descript. Absolutely. You should go to Descript.com spelled exactly how you would imagine it to be spelled. And we have a free version of Descript. We have a creator plan, which is just $12 a month. And then a pro version, which is 24 US a month. And if you want to see all the new features that they've added, there's great videos from Andrew Mason that they're both on Descript.com and on YouTube. And if you want a list of all of the new features that have been added to this version of Descript, go to help.descript.com. It has a full listing of that and all the new short keyboard uh, changes as well, if you really want them. Um, Jay, thank you so much. Where can people also, if they want to give feedback, what's the best way of giving feedback on it? Oh, absolutely. So you should join our Discord community. One of the many things that we want to invest in using our newfound funding is community. So we want to bring together creators and communicators and give you all a voice and support you however we can. So come to the Descript Discord. You'll find links all over the Descript website and also in our help center. We'll see you there. Brilliant. Thanks, Jay. And yeah, I look forward to using Storyboard much more. Maybe I have not just got a face for radio. Maybe I have a face for video. Who knows? Hey, you know, we also have stock footage, so you can just use that too. Thank God. <laughs> Great seeing you, Sam. Jay LaBeouf from Descript. I've been using it for a while and it's a pretty smart tool. It's getting much, much more sprightly on my old fashioned MacBook Pro, you know, the one with uh, without the Apple chip inside it. Uh, so that's always nice to end up seeing. Um, and um, yeah, I'm playing around with the video stuff uh, today. It should be fun after this very show. So looking forward to finding out quite how that bit works. Yeah, I thought it was quite interesting to look at the emphasis they've put on video. In fact, I'd said to Jay, you know, it feels more like a video tool than an audio tool. Um, and, you know, he was talking about how they had to catch up against other video uh, editing tools. Um, I'm not 100% sure that I like the new UI. I don't know if you what your thoughts are. It feels very minimalist. And I was talking to Matt Medeiros yesterday, who used it as well. And we both said it took us about half an hour, 40 minutes to try and get our heads into the new version. Um, so there is a... If you have been using Descript, there is a learning curve to get over into where the new buttons are, which you were expecting, uh, and also how to use the video stuff. But it is worth doing, I think, once you've got over that hurdle. Yeah, and I think it, um, you know, it's a good evolution and certainly runs an awful lot faster. There's been an awful lot of work on the performance of it. I do an awful lot of speaking in front of radio people, and I show Descript to them. I'm going to have to update that video now. But I show Descript to them actually editing this very podcast. And they are just astonished at what it will do. Being able to firstly, just be able to edit audio from a transcript, but also secondly, that overdub thing of being able to correct um, words using an automatically generated version of my voice. Um, you know, they are amazed at that. Uh, and in fact, if you listened to episode 100 of the old show, then right at the beginning of it, you will hear me reading out the date. And I actually got the date wrong when we recorded. I got the month wrong. And I thought, oh, no, I've got the month wrong. For episode 100 as well, how embarrassing. 
And then I remembered that you can just uh, use the overdub service. And it was very cool. So, uh, yeah, and you'd never know by listening to it. It's a, it's a great service. So hurrah for them. Yeah, and uh, I do suspect they're going to be developing much more of that video capability. But, uh, yeah, enjoy Descript while, while you've got the new version. Uh, now, moving on. This is, a, this is an interesting story. Apple's topic tags. Um Dan Meisner from Bumper has discovered that Apple Podcasts is quietly tagging individual podcast episodes by topic. The topics are used to help Apple's search engine and are linked to Wikipedia pages and Wikidata identifiers. Now, you wrote about this, James, and you also, of course, in typical James Cridlin fashion, went off and built a tool as well just to do something. So come on, James, give us the background. What's this all about and <laughs> what did you go and build? I mean, this is very cool by Apple. So Apple is clearly listening to your show. They can't be doing this any other way. So they're listening to your show. They're working out what topics you're talking about. And then they're dumping, hidden away in the uh, website uh, for your show or for your episode on Apple Podcasts. They're hiding away these topics um, and they're proper topics linked to open data, the semantic web, um, uh, which is very nice using the Wikidata uh, stuff, uh, which is very cool. So I built an Apple Podcasts episode topic viewer uh, snappy name. And what that enables you to do is go and have a look at any podcast in Apple Podcasts, any episode of that podcast, and work out whether or not these clever new topics are being produced for those episodes. Um, interestingly, they aren't doing topics for the Pod News Weekly Review. Not quite sure why not. Maybe it's because we've recently changed name or something else. I oh, don't know. But the Pod News Daily, they're doing topics for. Um, now, the topics are fairly um, generic in terms of that. You know, it's all about podcasting and digital audio and that sort of thing. But they're still getting all of that data out of there. But if you go into the daily or you go into the news agents or something like that, it's uh, tremendous the amount of information that they are pulling out of that, which would make for a um, really good advertising tool. But they're clearly not using it for that. They're, ma they're mainly using it for some uh, search engine work. So if you type in a topic that has been talked about, even if it's not in the episode description or in the title, it will still find it, uh, which is pretty cool. So it's well worth having a look at. Mm. So I was going to say, why are they doing this? But you think it's because of a search engine. Um, any other reasons that they might do this? Recommendations? Uh, discovery? All of those things. I mean, they could they could be doing it for moderation reasons as well. Um, if you're talking about specific topics that are, yeah, you know, I mean, COVID is is an obvious one. If you mention COVID, then would um, the Apple Podcasts topic thing work out that you're talking about COVID? And then, you know, I don't know, maybe in the future, put that uh, if you want to get the facts about COVID, go to this website thing that uh, Spotify does. So perhaps they're doing that. I don't know, mm. um, but uh, really interesting. The question, I suppose, is how long this data is going to stay on the Apple Podcasts website or whether or not all of a sudden they pull all of this data out as people have discovered that it's there. Um, so my suspicion that they, is that they will probably kill it. But, uh, you know, Dan uh, Meisner is doing some very clever things with that data and has now uh, been uh, circulating with uh, a couple of people um, not just, um, you know, podcasts and their neighbourhoods, so other podcasts that people listen to. He's also now uh, put all of the topic information into there as well. So you can even see, OK, we talk about, I don't know, Activity Pub, and so do all of these other podcasts as well. And perhaps that's a really handy tool that you can use for finding new shows that you want to have a listen to, shows that talk about the same things as these shows do. Yeah, very useful. Let's hope they do develop it. Now, uh, Acast has been doing something similar, it feels mm. like. They've got something called keyword targeting. Um, they announced that recently, and it's a way for advertisers to target topics and keywords uh, they wish to advertise next to. The tool joins their conversational targeting, which matches podcast content with the IAB's content taxonomy. So this, in the highlight, I suppose, James, sounds to me exactly like what Apple just seemed to be doing in the background, doesn't it? Yes, they may or may not be doing it 
um, quite in the same way. If Acast are doing it cleverly, then again, they'll be using topics into the Wikidata uh, topic uh, information, and that would be that would be very clever, wouldn't it? Um, but I'm not quite sure quite how Acast are doing it. But yeah, instead of just hoping that there's an IEB category for you, uh, which is what Acast launched a little bit earlier on this year, uh, you know, keyword targeting would allow you to you know, grab any keyword that you specifically wanted to target against or, of course, to avoid. And that's the other sort of side of it is this brand safety, the stuff that Todd Cochran likes so much um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, you could use this as a reason not to advertise in a podcast because, you know, this podcast is talking about guns or this podcast is talking about pornography or whatever it might be. Um, but, um, you know, Acast doing this sort of thing, of course, it's partially to do with a um, a bit of survival because Acast won't be able to use cookies um, uh, anymore because of uh, changing privacy rules. Um, so perhaps it's um, it's a bit to do with that, but um, you know, a very cool systems to enable you to advertise next to the content that you want to advertise to. Mm, I think this is smart. Um, look, we add keywords to all of our podcast episodes. I go through and I pick out the. Uh, let's say, the the guests and the companies and some of the topics we've talked about. But that's us doing it mm. manually. And I don't know if many people do that, actually. In fact, I know most people don't do that. So I guess mm. this is the automated way of getting it out of podcasts. But it would be nice if uh, podcast hosts or creators did actually put their own keywords in as well. Yes, it would be. But I, I guess on the other side, that's also a recipe for spam. And that's why keywords aren't used in things like Google anymore, because people just uh, spam, um, you know, keywords in there anyway. So perhaps it's a, right. it's a slightly different way and it's, you know, computationally difficult. But clearly this is something that um, Apple has that Spotify doesn't. Spotify's podcast search is pretty rubbish if you've ever tried it, um, whereas Apple's podcast search always appears is to have the show that you really want at number one. Um, I'm not quite sure how Apple do that, but this is clearly part of their secret source, so to speak. Now, let's move on. Edison Research, their share of ear surveys come out, uh, and it says podcasting's daily reach continues to rise. Uh, it posts a 20% year-on-year increase. Now, uh, 18% of people in the US age 13 plus. I always find that weird that they use 13 plus. I don't really consider kids using podcasts, but that's maybe just me. Listen every day. Uh, the mm. graph that's in Pod News, that if you want to go and have a look, it shows that more people are listening to podcasts, which means content creators have the opportunity to grow time spent listening with those people. So it's good news, isn't it, James? It's growing. It is good news. It's um, a slightly weird news because Edison Research, if you remember back when they unveiled the new uh, data um, from the uh, share of ear, they unveiled some data at uh, Podcast Movement Evolutions, and we were all quite sad because podcasting's uh, weekly reach, I think, had actually gone down. And so I find it interesting that Edison have posted this chart, which is um, yearly data from 2014 all the way up to 2021, and then they've put in quarter three 2022. Um, and it's only daily reach. And it's, it's kind of a bit like Edison Research going, we've got some figures that are showing podcasting's going up now. Let's let's show that. Um, so not quite sure the thinking behind Edison Research uh, showing this, but nevertheless, really handy and nice to see. I think it's, um, it's 13 plus because that's just the standard in the US that um, that uh, all stats are done for. Um, interestingly, if you compare that to, I think, um, uh, the podcasting data that Edison Research puts together for Canada is, I think, 18 plus, and for the UK, it's 16 plus. So there's this sort of differing um, lower level, uh, depending on which particular country you're in. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, uh, adults, basically, if, if you think of a... If you think of a, somebody at 14 being an adult, I think there's probably a young adult, certainly. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, interesting to see numbers continuing to rise. Yeah, isn't it? Because American high schools start ages 14 to 18. Um, ah, that might be it. And uh, that might be it's it. always been a, a weird one because one of my kids were 
um, 11 and they start senior school here in the UK, you know, suddenly they mm. want their mobile phone and they want his access to Facebook and Instagram and all that. And it's like, well, no, you're underage because it says it's 13 plus. And I never understood that, but now I do. That's because America starts later than we do. There'll be lots of Americans having listened to this uh, shouting at their... Uh uh, shouting at their podcast apps at the moment. <laughs> if you're shouting at the podcast app, don't do that. Press the boost button and send us a message. That would be a lovely thing. Now, uh, IAB certification. Oh, IAB, right? Hmm, here we go. Uh, the IAB Tech Lab is now requiring annual recertification from podcast companies. In a note that has appeared sometime over the past month on the IAB's website, the IAB says it's updating its compliance program to require annual recertification certification. Um, James, tell me more, because uh, on the back of the iHeartMedia thing where, you know, two seconds or whatever it was, or five seconds of a podcast listen qualified as an IAB listen, um, is this anything to do with that or is this totally separate? Uh, it is totally separate from that, but uh, there are a couple of things here. Firstly, it's basically saying if you are certified for the version 2.0 podcast measurement guidelines, then you have to book in a recertification now. You've got until the end of this year to do it. And if you don't do that, then you will lose your certification. So that's uh, the first thing that they've ended up doing. The second thing that they've basically said is, we will do recertification every year from here on in. And to be honest, I think that that's quite sensible um, because uh, people's code stack do change and it's important to just make sure that they haven't introduced any bugs um, in any changes to some of the code that they're ending up doing. So I can kind of see that. I think, uh, you know, the concern was that IAB recertification is incredibly expensive, or certainly was incredibly expensive. It used to cost $45,000 plus another $10,000 to become an IAB member in the first place if you wanted a certificate for IAB certification. It turns out that um, just as they didn't tell anybody about this annual re recertification and you had to find it on the website, it turns out that they've also not told anybody that they've changed their prices too. And instead of being $45,000, it's now 12500 which is still a lot, but it's much less. And renewals, only 6250 So, um, you know, I mean, why they didn't um, say that on the um, on that note? Why they didn't actually publicise that note? They know where we live, um, so why the PR company didn't bother actually telling anybody? Who knows? But um, uh, yeah, I, f I found uh, I found that interesting. But I think it's probably the right thing to do to basically make sure that those people that are trading on those numbers are making sure that those numbers are still being calculated in the correct way. It's an annoying amount of extra money and extra hassle, but I think it's certainly worthwhile doing. Is there any other updates though, James, about the iHeartMedia thing, or has that just been washed under the carpet now and just we've moved on? I mean, I think the iHeartMedia thing highlights the fact that um, we are measuring downloads rather than measuring listens. And I think that that's a, a bit of a problem. Um, now, of course, we tried to measure listens in the past with um, RAD, which was something that uh, NPR um, uh, said would be a good idea. And everybody put their hands up and said, this is dreadful. This is the worst idea in the world. Um, perhaps we'll try again with the podcast events tag in the new podcast namespace. But however we do it, I think we should be measuring listens rather than downloads. And the reason why the iHeartMedia stuff um, irritated so many people, I think, in the industry is that they were clearly gaming the system. There's no other way uh, around it. They were uh, producing something that would easily have downloaded 20 minutes worth of audio, um, uh, would have counted as an IAB download, even though clearly people were only going to listen to it for less than, you know, uh, a minute, less than, you know, 15 seconds, frankly. Um, so I think, um, you know, I, I think that that's um, a, a fundamental problem with measuring downloads rather than measuring actual plays and actual listens. And uh, the sooner we get to doing that, the better, I think. Yeah, I know Leo Laporte on one of his uh, podcasts has said he's actually asked for a total refund from iHeartMedia for all his advertising. Wow. 
Well, I mean, that would be the right uh, the right thing to end up doing. Uh, Leo followed me on Mastodon this afternoon, so which was uh, nice of him. Um, so um, yeah, I should uh, I should ask him. Look at you. I know. I should <laughs> I should ask him uh, a little bit more about that. He calls uh, he's he's got a fantastic. Uh, yes, he calls himself the Chief Twit, obviously, as you know. And uh, in case you're wanting to follow him on Mastodon, and you should, uh, he's Leo at twit.social. Yes, it's, uh, one other person who's got a dot social domain. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you, you know, if I was a advertiser and I was um, and I discovered that uh, iHeart was doing this sort of thing, I would be demanding my money back as well. I'll be mm. honest. Now let's move on to uh, sadly a little bit more Twitter news. Um, I'm trying to keep up with Elon. Uh, I don't know if you're trying to keep up with him as well, James. Um, first of all, you could buy your blue check. So. Basically, your blue check now means you've got a receipt and a credit card. Um, then he stopped mm-hmm. it. Then he put a grey check mark. Did you get your grey check marks, James? Are you official again? I don't know. Did you get one? <laughs> uh, I still have a blue check mark. Um, I am an right. old, an OG blue check. In that um, this How can was we tell this was way back when you could actually upload ID details to Twitter, send them into Twitter, and they would give you your blue check if you managed to convince them uh, that you were who you said you were. Now, this now comes with a problem. Uh, um, as a number of people have found out, we, the old the old guard blue checkers, are not able to edit our names on Twitter anymore um, because quite a lot of people were pretending to be, you know, somebody else. In fact, there was a brilliant person. I can't, I can't remember who the, who the particular person on Twitter was, but quite famous um, person on uh, Twitter who complained to Elon that, um, that uh, she couldn't change her Twitter handle. And Elon uh, did something clever in the back end and said, oh, you can now. And so she instantly changed her Twitter handle to Elon Musk, which was hilarious. Um, very, very bad. But yes, so um, yes, so they've fiddled around with that. Um, and uh, that's very annoying. They've also um, they also sacked lots of people, and then they invited some people back, and then they have sacked even more people, m- many of their contractors. And now Elon has given the remaining staff two days to work out whether they're in or out, and says that you know if you're not in the office on Monday, then you have resigned, which is of course a very different. Uh, legal thing than if you have been um, got rid of through redundancy. Um, Plus, there's all kinds of problems with the GDPR in Europe because they, by all accounts, have closed pretty well everybody, uh, everybody's uh, positions in the Dublin uh, office, which they need for tax reasons, but which they also need for GDPR reasons. Um, And so I think there's a few things there left because all of Europe goes through the Irish tax office. Um, or the Irish Twitter office, which is, of course, then used for tax. Um, So all of this is just an utter mess. Um, But uh, yes, Dave Weiner has some views, though, hasn't he? Well, Dave's very much uh, on the... I haven't seen Dave this excited for ages now. Dave Weiner, for those who don't know, was one of the co-authors of the RSS um, feed. And he hasn't really done much in in recent years. He's he's sort of been a curmudgeon, if I'd be brutally honest, just sort of moaning about stuff. But he suddenly, I don't know what, rolled up his sleeves, got his old uh, IDE editor out, and he's now producing verbs for Mastodon. He's talking about inbound and outbound RSS, and he's talking about if you add .RSS to the end of your Mastodon account, you can get your RSS feed. Um, and he says, uh, to Toys Earth, this is a good model for you to emulate. Please give users fees. This is the way of the future of microblogging. Uh, so, yeah, he's very excited. And as I said, he's written his first four wor- verbs. Um, I looked at them, didn't understand any of them. But hey, Dave, I'm sure that they're very intelligent and uh, very useful. 
but there you go. Yes, it's, it's, it's just fascinating seeing that and fascinating seeing the growth of Mastodon, which of course is um, is under the hood, uses a thing called ActivityPub. Yeah, and uh, I, again, we've heard of ActivityPub recently from our friends at Casterpod who've been using it and of course uh, for something we've called Cross Comments. And so again, it seemed that it wasn't really taking off that sort of cross commenting. We, it had worked, but... There wasn't a mass adoption across all of the podcast apps, but maybe there will be now. And I suddenly realised that one of the co-authors of the original Activity Streams, which was the precursor to Activity Pub before IBM got hold of it and made it a W3 standard, was our friend of the show, Chris Messina. So I, sh- I quickly got online, shouted out to Chris, hey, any chance you can come on the show and tell us about the history of Activity Streams and how it all came about, and he did. So Activity Pub was an evolution of a format that I created with some of my friends called Activity Streams. And the concept of Activity Streams was to add more fidelity and information to RSS feeds. So RSS at the time was the way to syndicate blogs. Blogs were kind of a way of taking or serving the job of newspapers, but on normal everyday people's posts. And so that would syndicate and you could follow updates for people writing things. The core insight for Activity Streams and then Activity Pub was to say, well, we want to be able to syndicate information just more than just blog posts. And we want to be able to articulate verbs beyond just write. And we also want to specify a noun, who is the actor in this context. And so we had a very simple, what's called a tuple, essentially a relationship between three things, an actor, a verb, and an object. So the standard in RSS and the standard in the Atom format as well was Chris wrote a blog post. But if you wanted to say Sam added Chris as a friend, well, we needed to enhance the standard to be able to express that so that clients who were receiving that information would know how to render it correctly. Yeah, that's a little clip there. And it's a great interview with Chris. And it's such a good interview. I thought it needed a podcast all of its own. So instead of taking that interview and completely cut it up and uh, only giving Chris five minutes, which uh, frankly wouldn't be particularly fair, uh, I, I didn't do that. Instead, it's up in full in our new podcast. Sam, we've got another new <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Who would have thought it? It's called Pod News Extra. And you'll find Pod News Extra in any Podcast Index app or in Apple Podcasts. It's just called Pod News Extra. Haven't bothered putting it in Spotify yet. Probably Probably will do that uh, a little bit later today. It's also in our channel on Apple Podcasts too, which is called Podcast Industry News, if you've not yet seen that. So if you want to hear the full interview uh, with Sam and Chris Messina, you want to be going and finding the brand new Pod News Extra podcast. I feel like the strap line should be extra, extra, hear all about it. Oh, nice. Anyway, nice. I see what you've done there. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? That might be a plan. <laughs> So uh, very oh, cool, and gosh. we are we are both on Mastodon, aren't we? Well, you are. I'm sort of hanging about like a bad smell there, but yeah, you're at James at Crid Land, and I am at Sam Sethi at Podcast Index Social. I do pop in there occasionally, but you are more active than I am. I think. Yes, I, I've kind of moved in there as my permanent home now, and I'm uh, very Ooh. occasionally checking uh, Twitter. But yes, I I I am I'm all in and really enjoying it. So a lot of hard work at the beginning, just to warn you. But once you're in, uh, you'll really enjoy it. Sounds like a nightclub entry. (laughs) (laughs) Right, let's have a look around the world. And uh, we start off in uh, Germany. There's new data about German podcast uh, consumption and indeed audio consumption on the internet. Broadcasters and publishers ARD and ZDF have produced research about audio consumption on the internet. Uh, Podcast listening has doubled in the last four years in Germany, according to the data. Now, 40% of German adults listen at least once a month to podcasts. Uh, which is uh, good numbers coming out of there. And my question when I saw that instantly, James, was is this native German podcast, i.e. language specific, or is this UK, English, American type podcast that they're just consuming like the rest of the world? 
I believe it's uh, I believe it's a little bit of both, but uh, Germany doesn't have a massive amount of people who speak English in the same way as, for example, the Netherlands or Sweden or Norway do. Um, so there's going to be much more German language uh, stuff that goes on there. But that would be interesting to have a look at, wouldn't it? Well, all I'm going to say is a lecker. Uh, yes, Dave Jones won't understand that, but Adam Curry will. Uh, it's over to the Netherlands. Um, podcast hosting and monetization platform Acast has launched in the Netherlands. It's signing with a Mer, de, Mer van Diet. I'm going to know that I'm going to get a booster gram from Adam Curry saying I butchered that. Um <laughs> a podcast studio over in Holland. It says now 49% of Dutch adults listen to podcasts in the country. Um, so yeah, so just ahead. I feel I feel like I'm doing the Eurovision Song Contest at 40% is the Germans, but coming in at 49%, <laughs> we have the Dutch. Yes, except it's 49% of Dutch adults isn't a podcast at some point in the country. There's no, there's no once a month or any of that, uh, oh. but still anyway. Um, but yeah, interesting seeing Acast jumping into that particular market. Uh, of course, Podimo being uh, very big, of course, in the Netherlands market. They've bought a a large um, Netherlands podcast uh, studio as well. Uh, So Acast uh, signing a big podcast studio um, in the the country is also uh, interesting. Uh, Speaking about Podimo, which is, of course, based in the Scandic countries in uh, Denmark. Is Denmark one of the Scandic countries or one of the Nordic countries? I always get confused. Mm. I always get told off. Anyway, Mm. uh, up in Sweden... Um, which of course is the home of Acast as well. Uh, an audiobook and ebook subscription service called Storytel has raised 400 million Swedish crowns, which is $37 million, uh, which is uh, pretty big uh, too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I have to say, do Swedish VCs just love audio? Because, I mean, Podimo raised over $70 million, and here's another massive raise as well. Or, or do the yeah. Swedish VCs just have a lot of money that they don't know what to do with? In which case, I'm right a document now and sending it over yeah yeah you should uh, you should be translating your secret thing that we can't talk about into <laughs> swedish uh <laughs> that would be a that would be a bright idea yes um so uh, yes, well, yes. Who who knows what's going on there? But it's I mean it's clearly a time for the raising of money because uh, we covered Descript earlier in France. Audion, uh, which is an audio and podcast monetization company with a very French name, Audion, um, they have raised uh, six point two million dollars in a Series A funding round, which will enable the company to hire fifty people in the next twelve to eighteen months. Presumably, fifty very cheap people um, for six point two million. But anyway. Yeah, maybe they are. Um, But it is a record funding amount for French audio ad tech, so they say, um, which is um, interesting to end up seeing. They are uh, both in France, but also in the UK as well, where presumably they're called Audion. Um, because you know what the Brits are like. I mean, it's not Nestle, is it? It's Nestles. Nestles. Nestles Kit Kat. Um, So, so yes, so that's what uh, is going on uh, there. And, uh, yeah, and there's uh, stuff going on in the UK as well, isn't there? Well, just to prove you wrong, James, I'm just going to go, Sacre Bleu. There you go. That was my French GCSE there. One word I remember. (laughs) Very good. In the UK, Octave Audio, and don't tell me that's supposed to be called Octave or something stupid. Uh, Octave Audio <laughs> has re- renewed its partnership with Veritonics, a brand lift technology. I read that sentence when you wrote it, and I have no idea still what it means, so tell me more. Well, Octave Audio, Octave Audio, uh, is um, uh, uh, Bauer and News UK. So it's basically the uh, the number two and the number three commercial radio companies working together um, to do things with uh, streaming broadcast radio, but also podcasts as well. Um, and their partnership with Veritonic, which um, they've been in for the last, I'm going to guess, a year, um, they've re-signed that uh, which essentially is attribution and um, and that sort of stuff. So it's basically measuring how well the podcast advertising and indeed audio advertising is working for Bauer Media and News UK's wireless uh, as well. So um, that's what's going on there. Apparently, it's a robust um, solution and it lends itself well to verifying and amplifying the impact of audio campaigns. 
Um, so says a company spokesperson. Had I known that was going to be the answer, James, I wouldn't have included it. That was boring. Now, moving <laughs> on. <laughs> well, moving on. Uh, still something going on in the UK and Ireland. Apple Podcasts have finally realised that uh, the UK and Ireland exists. Hooray! And they've now got <laughs> Apple Podcasts Spotlight which, of course, they launched a year or so ago uh, in the US. Uh, they've now launched it in the UK and Ireland. So if you um, go and uh, have a look at the Apple Podcast Spotlight in your app, you will see um, actually a podcast from Acast being uh, promoted. Um, weirdly, it's um, three people who are Londoners but who live in Amsterdam, um, so I'm not, not quite sure why they've ended up being the first Apple podcast spotlight in the UK and Ireland, given that they live in Amsterdam. But anyway, there we go. Um, and they are uh, doing some wonderful things. Um, if you are a winner of the spotlight from Apple Podcasts, you also get up to 16 hours of recording time in central London, which obviously these people won't be interested in because they're in Amsterdam. Um, but um, And it's uh, being uh, put together, I believe, by the Apple um, editorial team in London. Uh, I actually met with the Apple editorial team in uh, the Apple Podcasts editorial team, I should say, in Sydney uh, not so long ago. So, um, yeah, they've got them all around the globe. Um, and it's interesting to see them, you know, working and continuing to promote stuff. All I'm waiting for now is a Twitter account or indeed a Mastodon account which isn't just US stuff, because nobody's interested in that. So it'd be interesting to have a look at uh, Apple Podcasts UK, for example, and seeing how they're doing. Uh, this is a message for Jake Head uh, from a message heard. Um, remember, you were going to introduce me to the Apple editorial team, Jake, um, because who, she, he, they or it clearly is worth now knowing. So there you go. <laughs> yes. Why, you really want your 16 hours of recording time in central London, do you? <laughs> wow, beats, beats sitting in my studio here. Yes. <laughs> Now, uh, finally in the UK, uh, friends of the show, Crowd Network, have launched a new crowd sports division. This is something that they've been planning for a while, and they've launched it with a dedicated Apple channel. They do a lot of good stuff in the sports podcast uh, arena, and yeah, so have a check out of them as well. The Tech Stuff, tech stuff. on the Pod News Weekly Review. Yes, it's the stuff you'll find every Monday in the Pod News newsletter. And here's where we do all of the tech talk. You've found a uh, particularly long and involved blog post from Nathan Gaithwright, haven't you, here, Sam? Yeah, I, I spotted this and I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, Nathan says, I was curious which podcast hosts published the most transcripts through the new podcast transcript tag. And I thought, hmm, yeah, I'll be interested to understand as well. So he went to the font of all knowledge, John Spurlock, uh, to help him rank it all together. And mm -hmm. here are the results, James. Go on, I'll let you read them yeah, out. He's a, he's a massive ranker, isn't he, John Spurlock? <laughs> um, couldn't resist it. Uh, number five, RSS.com. Number four, Transistor. Number three, Sounder with 14%. Number two, Captivate with 16% of all of their episodes with transcripts. But the number one is our number one as well. It's Buzzsprout with 46% of all of their episodes with a transcript tag, which is pretty amazing, yeah. actually, 46%. That's a, that's a winning plan. They should all be 100%, by the way. Um, and uh, Apple Podcasts should support the transcript tag and, um, and, and be truly inclusive to everybody. But we're still not there. But nevertheless, wonderful to see Buzzsprout at number one. Mm, well done to uh, the boys down there. Now, uh, talking of John Spurlock, uh, he's a busy boy, isn't he? Uh, he's come up with a new user agent lookup list that's been uh, based on both the o OPORG, is that how you say it, James? OPORG, OPAG, um, and Buzzsprout's implementers. Um, look, this is not my area of knowledge, so I'm going to hand over to you to tell everyone about what this is all about. So basically, this is just a really easy and simple way for any podcast host to work out what has just downloaded that podcast. Was it Apple Podcasts? Was it Pocket Casts? Was it some random website somewhere? Um, so John has uh, really put the work in there in producing something which is open, which is public, which can be used. He'll obviously be using it for OP3, um, but it's also available for anybody else to end up using. I know that uh, Tom Rossi from Buzzsprout, uh, our sponsors, have been talking about uh, implementing it as well. It's, um, it's actually based on some of Buzzsprout's work um, anyway. 
and uh, but just has some more additional stuff in there. Uh, so there's a, a repo which is available now. If you are a podcast hosting company, you should definitely be taking a look at it because it's crazy that we are all inventing our own wheels here and all trying to keep up to date with the latest user agents and, and you know, what does Samsung Free look like? I don't know. What does, you know, um, Spotify look like on a, on a you know, car? Um, who knows what all of these things do? But if it's all in one place and everybody can contribute to it, then we all benefit out of that. So it's well worth to uh, have a look at. Uh, You'll find a link, of course, in the Pod News newsletter from Monday, but you'll also uh, find it in our show notes for this very show too. Mm. So moving on, uh, Castapodge has shared a presentation from Benjamin Bellamy and Yashin Dogri, who are the um, co-founders of Castapod's wonderful little platform, talking about using activity pub as we did earlier but they were talking about using a new technology called web monetization which is an alternative to cryptocurrency for micropayments and i shouldn't say cryptocurrency for micropayments james because everyone will get angry with us it's bitcoin nobody in the bitcoin world wants to be involved or touch cryptocurrency anymore ah yes well that's probably uh, that probably makes a bit of sense but uh, yes yeah, so web monetization is interesting i i'm uh, enabled for it on the pod news website Website. I wanted to be enabled for web monetization in the Pod News RSS feed as well, just because, you know, well, why not? Um, but you can't be enabled for more than one different type of value, uh, it turns out. So you're only allowed one tag and you're only allowed one way. So therefore, Lightning is the only way that I have chosen. Um, but uh, yeah, it's another way of, um, of uh, m- micro payments and seems to work quite well in terms of the way. Web, and could it work quite well in terms of podcasts? It probably could. So worthwhile taking a peek at. Do you know who's behind web monetization? Do I know who's behind web monetization? No, I don't. Do you know who's behind web monetization? No, I just thought it might be interesting to know if we're going to implement anything to do with them, who who might be behind it. You know, it could be the devil. Um, was for, you know, we don't know. So um, <laughs> no, <laughs> guess we better look it up, James. Yeah. Um, now, moving on, uh, talking about micropayments, James, the first Value for Value podcast is launched in Zimbabwe. Uh, in conversation with Trevor, hosted by the South African podcast company uh, Iono, it now accepts streaming sats and booster grand messages. Congratulations. Well done, chaps. Yeah, I think it's really good to see Value for Value being used in some uh, of the other countries that isn't just, you know, the US and and the UK and and that sort of thing. So um, good to see it um, appearing in uh, Zimbabwe, uh, where it should work, you would assume, pretty well. Uh, So uh, yeah, come in conversation with Trevor is the podcast to go and find. Now, The Guardian has launched something called Noisy Charts, um, a way of turning data into sound. Noisy Charts, yes, absolutely. Uh, let, let, let's um, uh, take a look at this. Um, there's some very clever people who work at The Guardian, and one of those clever people is a, a person called Nick Evershed, who works for The Guardian here in Australia. And one of the things that um, he has been working on is charts and data in The Guardian. So when, whenever you have a look at a fancy chart, then it looks all fancy and lovely. And part of that is Nick Evershed's work. And Nick did a lot, an awful lot of work around COVID, for example, um, uh, showing what the uh, figures were there. But he's now come up with um, an interesting idea. It's a new tool created by Guardian Australia to easily turn data into sound with animations to accompany it. You won't be able to see the animations, obviously, because this is a podcast. Um, But I can play you the sound Uh, Would you like to hear a noisy chart, Sam? Go on then. Okay. Uh, This is a noisy chart and it shows Mark Zuckerberg's average net worth per quarter. Here we go. (laughs) There you go. What do you think of your first noisy chart? Uh, yeah, somebody's had got either got too much time or just decided to watch some cartoons and get some uh, sound clips out. I have no idea whether you'd use that or not. <laughs> it does sound a little bit childish. I mean, sad trombone, for example. Why? Why you you would do that? Heaven alone knows. But it is quite. It's quite a sort of a smart thing in that you can see, you know, um, the amount of rainfall that's happened in Sydney over the last uh, year or so, and you can actually see. Oh God, what's the sound for that then? Oh God, don't don't <laughs> ask now. 
Why, yes, Sam, I do have that. And I haven't just spent the last three minutes um, fiddling around uh, trying to download it and play it. Yes. Would you would you like to hear the sound of the amount of rain which has happened um, over the last year in Sydney? Well, <laughs> that caveat at the end in Sydney means it could be nothing. But go on. Yes, please play it. And it starts quite nice and low. Oh. Really, there's not an awful lot of rain going on. Uh, and then, whoa, and then it goes up a bit uh, during March and April. And then wait until we get to August, September, which is where all of the big floods are. Any, any minute now. There you go. <laughs> Anyway, for anyone who's not tuned out so far, thanks for staying with us. There you go. Can we stop talking about noisy charts now? Yeah, never again. Moving on. <laughs> um, Excellent. Um, AI generated podcasts. Let's talk about them. Uh, Eric Borjos um, has um, made a very clever thing using the Buzzsprout API, which is all very smart. He's making more than 100 automated shows. He's uploading those automatically through Buzzsprout. Um, his code comes up with the title, the artwork, the images, um, which is the same as the artwork. So quite why I wrote that, I really don't know. It also comes up with the content as well. So it'll come up with the content. It turns it into voice. It then uh, adds titles and artwork to it, uploads it automatically, automatically through Buzzsprout, very, very clever system. Um, and um, I'm not going to play any of those because they sound exactly as you would expect them to, a sort of slightly robotic voice reading you nonsense. Uh, but nevertheless, I thought it was quite an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, look, Descript allows you with Overdub to do uh, automated voices. Um, I've seen a few of these on YouTube where you've got an automated voice reading out a transcript of, in my case, this is a football report, and I instantly have to turn them off. They just grate on me uh, and because I know they're not a human and I know that it's just a, a script mm. being read. I just think, oh, there's no point. I can't be bothered. That's just information. So it's not something I want. And I agree with um, Todd Cochran, who was talking on the new media show um, uh, this week and basically saying, ah, it'll never happen. Meh, get your own dot com. <laughs> uh, It'll never happen. I'm, I'm only doing this for the, for, for the boosts, of course. Boostergram. Boostergram Corner. 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 On the Pod News Weekly Review. Yes, it's our favourite time of the week, Boostergram Corner. And um, I, I'm a particular fan when we get a Boostergram of somebody who is complaining. Uh, so thank you to Hall of Famer Dave Jackson, uh, who has sent us uh, the Devil's Sat 6666. Thanks, Dave. And he says, thanks for not spelling Conchacks or putting a link he said sarcastically, is there a boo number? You know I love the show. We know you love the show, Dave. We should get you on because, uh, uh, yes, that would be a lovely thing. Thank you for the sats. Um, Conchax, can you remember how to spell that? Um, it's that wonderful um, that wonderful system uh, for Alby. It was, isn't it K-O-X, Shax? I think it's C-O-N-S-H-A-X dot app. Right. Conchax. And C O N S H A X dot app. I will very difficult to say that. Put a link in the show notes for certain this week, just yes. for you, Dave, just to make sure. Yes, just mark it for Dave Jackson. Uh, that that will. would be a good idea. Uh, Dave Jones, uh, a big rush boost. Great first episode for the new branding. Keep it up. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we don't talk about what 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 went before now. Uh, it's 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 all pod news from here on in. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, Brian from London uh, sent us a Israel boost 1948 sats um, saying first question mark and the answer is no. You're not first. You are third. <laughs> uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, very good of you, um, Adam Curry. Twenty five thousand sats. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, and he points out, and this is a very good point, a company that reports a loss cannot be improving profitability, just losing less. 
He's absolutely correct. <laughs> yes. Yes, he is absolutely correct. Um, the first um, booster, in case you're wondering, Brian of London, was uh, Dave Jones with a 12-1-1-2 um, sats, which is a kind of rush boost, um, uh, which was uh, the first one that came into us. And it said, hello, Pod News Weekly. Hello, Dave Jones. And it's Pod News Weekly Review, if you don't mind. But thank you very much. Uh, that's very kind. Uh, if you get value from what we do, the Pod News Weekly Review is separate from Pod News. Sam and I share everything from it. We really appreciate your support so we can continue making this show. So you can support us with cash at podnews.net slash weekly support, which nobody's done. Or you can support us with sats by hitting the boost button in your podcast app. And if you don't have a boost button in your podcast app, podnews.net slash new podcast apps will help you find a new app like Fountain, for example. Uh, what's been happening for you this week, Sam? Uh, what's been happening for me this week? Oh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I'm making great progress with my little secret project. I promise it, the alpha will be out shortly. Um, and Sam Talks Technology I had a, a lovely chat with both Ben and Alberto from rss.com who are sponsoring it. Uh, so we're about to launch episode one of that. So yeah, all good stuff. What's up with you, James? It, well, is your secret project um, is your secret project something that uh, might be covered in pod news in the future? I'd hope so. Yes. Uh, if not, I'm sneaking it in. If we can put that octave stuff in, we're getting in uh, my story as well. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, you asked about my week. Um, uh, I am looking forward to the Brisbane Podcasters Meetup. It's on November the 25th. It's in South Bank, which is in Brisbane. I, I know there's a South Bank in London. It's not that one. I know that there's a South Bank in Melbourne. It's not that one. It's the South Bank in Brisbane, which is only one word. Um, there's more information at pod.events. If you are in Southeast Queensland, it would be lovely to see you November the 25th in the evening. Um, that would be splendid. And I'm off to Sydney next week to the Australian Podcast Awards. And if you're going to the Australian Podcast Awards, it would be great to catch up with you if you're going to. Uh, you can uh, get a hold of me on Mastodon or through Signal or, you know, Twitter or any of the other ways. Um, that would be lovely. Or even via Telstra, if that still works. Um, uh, that would be a splendid thing. Uh, and that's it for this week. You can give us feedback using email to a weekly at podnews.net or send us a boostergram, which we prefer. If your podcast app doesn't support boosts, then grab a new app from podnews.net forward slash new podcast apps our music is from studio dragonfly our voiceover is sheila d and we're hosted and sponsored by buzzsprout podcast hosting made easy get updated every day subscribe to our newsletter at podnews.net tell your friends and grow the show and support us and support us the pod news weekly review will return next week keep listening 